Good afternoon from Asia Central uh, DBS. Uh, we are live, 4 p.m. in Singapore. Uh, welcome to our audience. Uh, this is one more session of DBS Macro Insights live streaming. Title of our presentation today is Living with Volatility. Uh, we actually published a presentation last week, a publication last week, which was all about how in FX and rates and credit space, we have seen considerable pickup in ups and down, hence the volatility in the markets. Uh, good news today, and therefore everywhere you see it's a sea of green, but just a couple of days ago, there was a lot of bad news and it was a sea of red. Uh, uh, this is the pattern that we're living in. Uh, don't get carried away by what the markets are telling you today, and definitely don't get carried away what the market was telling you last week. Uh, the truth is somewhere in between, but living with this volatility across asset classes is, seen, is in our view, the, the main challenge right now. Uh, we have five major issues to go through today. Uh, we will talk about uh, the, the big discussion in the markets about recession signals with yield curve inversion, as well as you know the latest on trade wars. Extending from that, we'll touch on the oil and gold issue, um, where uh, the, those markets are telling us in terms of global demand and risk aversion. Uh, Radhika Rao, our economists and strategists, will then touch on monetary and fiscal policy, both in Asia and elsewhere in the context of these ongoing uh, global uh, political and macroeconomic concerns. Uh, Philip we our senior FX strategist, will touch on the popular subject of exchange rates, especially with the US dollar, but also on our view with respect to the Chinese currencies and as well as the currencies from the UK, Europe and Singapore. And finally, Duncan Tan, um, he has been with us for uh, more than a year, but this is his debut in live stream. We'll be talking about the negative yield universe and what it means for the rates outflow. We have a dozen or so questions from you guys uh, around the last five, seven minutes of this uh, call would be devoted to going over that. So let's get right into it. First issue is regarding recession signals and trade wars. Uh, we will begin by looking at some of the data uh, outside, uh, coming out of the US as well as um, uh, major economic corners of the world. Uh, the Atlanta Fed now cast in the last couple of days uh, for the U.S. has turned slightly uh, bearish. Uh, when we look at it uh, in the last couple of months, July, August, it had drifted up steadily toward two and a quarter percent. We saw some decent data on the retail sales side, on the housing side, but lately. Uh, the data flow has turned somewhat unfavorable uh, coming in from the trade side uh, and on, of course the durable investment side which is certainly showing signs of stress. We've seen PMI numbers for the US turn south joining basically the global trend uh, and uh, services PMI would be another area where we'll be looking at. This is a critical week uh, for the data flow. We have weekly jobless claims, for services PMI, ISM manufacturing and so on coming out and then tomorrow night a non-farm Rolls, basically the final set of data points that the Fed officials will get to digest before they meet up uh, in, a, in a 10 days or so time to decide on monetary policy. Uh, we will talk a lot about our Fed outlook. I just want to focus now on the data flow and moving beyond the U.S., just looking at the data flow in terms of surprise. Uh, what we see is not a really, really uh, sort of source of despair. Uh, that was actually a few weeks ago when we saw uh, relentless negative surprise coming on the data front, um, particularly out of China, but also from the US and somewhat from the Eurozone. Things are not as bad as the market pricing on the fixed income side would tend to suggest. Um, you know, other than a few poor data developments out of the US, by and large, beyond the issue of trade, where the data is still weak, but beyond trade, uh, global demand is not that poor. We will see how the uh, commodity markets and uh, uh, metals markets are reacting to that as well as shipping freight rates later on on this issue. Uh, but my key takeaway from the economic surprise uh, data flow out of the US, Eurozone and China right now is that it could have been far worse. Uh, given the amount of noise we have seen out of trade war over the course of the past year or so, given the structural slowdown on the electronic side and auto manufacturing side, global economy is actually not that out of shape. We haven't seen any major systemic risk. Uh, we've seen a lot of flight to safety, but we haven't seen the reasons for the flight to safety manifest in bank distress or major economic uh, dislocation. Uh, emerging markets are under some pressure. Argentina has significant amount of pressure, but beyond that, elsewhere in the emerging market, especially in Asia, uh, the noise out of the news 
systems and actually is dominating the actual data flow in our view. Moving on, uh, and as, as, as promised, uh, the next slide, uh, slide number five, is looking at what's happening with the Baltic Dry Freight Index as well as China PMI. Uh, we have found in the past China's economic fortune up or down tend to have a huge impact on global um, trade uh, flows. Uh, the Baltic Dry Freight in the last few months has actually perked up a bit. It was reflecting extremely weak sentiments uh, beginning of 2019. But since then, uh, based around China stimulus, based around uh, some stability of demand worldwide, uh, it's, it's picked up uh, and perked up quite a bit, although you cannot say the same about uh, Chinese PMI. So the relationship uh, has somewhat broken down in the last couple of months. But the question is going forward, would the, young China, uh, the, the weak China PMI break down the Baltic trade index, or is it demonstrating some sort of a leading property that it is actually going to be pulling up the uh, Chinese PMI? Remains to be seen. Uh, we're not very hopeful, but again, uh, it does uh, give us some mild comfort going into the final quarter of the year. Um, the one thing that could hurt the economic outlook is if there were going to be very severe sell-off in the financial markets and major tightening of financial market conditions as a result. We saw this happen in late 2018, early 2019, when uh, financial conditions tightened substantially around the US, but also in the Eurozone. Since then, a lot of dovish talk from the US and, and major uh, decline in long-term interest rates in the US has led to uh, improvement in financial conditions. In the last couple of months or so, we again saw some tightening, uh, and, and, and that's something that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, is happening with dollar liquidity and so on. And this relates to one particular concern that we have for dollar borrowers that we will touch on a little later. Uh, I'm going to move on now and focus on our forecast. Uh, we are not forecasting a recession in the U.S. in 2020. We see some slowdown, uh, as do most analysts and multilateral organizations. Um, when you look at the slide that's on the screen right now, on the right-hand side, we have the 2020 growth inflation forecast for U.S., EU, and Japan. Uh, we see U.S. growth slow down on the back of weak investment, but we don't see a complete collapse in demand, particularly on the consumption side, which would create recession-like tendencies. We also think that policy, particularly on the country policy side, would be providing significant amount of buffer to steady demand in the U.S. and keep market conditions stable. So around 1.5% growth next year, which may compel the Fed to cut some more. Uh, we will see uh, where that goes. Uh, but as far as the EU and the uh, Japanese economies are concerned, uh, growth more or less the same as where we are this year, um, and uh, inflation maybe a tad higher. Uh, but again, that remains a source of uncertainty, uh, depends on what's happening to commodities, depends on what's happening to uh, the pass-through from trade wars, of which so far we haven't seen much of an impact on resale prices worldwide. So inflation, not a big deal going into 2020, growth, some slowdown, but we are definitely not in the camp of major doom and gloom out of Europe or UN. We're not forecasting an outbreak recession. Uh, just uh, to take stock of where key indicators and policy stands in the major corners of the world reside. Uh, so looking at slide seven of this presentation, as you can see, trade is by and large poor. Uh, in the US also, it's been poor, um, but not yet poor as the major economies that rely heavily on manufactured goods exports. Uh, EU and emerging markets in Japan would be in that camp, not necessarily the US. And those three areas have seen very poor trade numbers, and the PMIs have been weakening across the board. Policy, by and large, is accommodating everywhere. One can argue that EU is more on the neutral side than what we are calling it as accommodating, that the accommodating stance has been there for a long, long time, but by and large now is neutral. They would need to ease further to get more accommodation. Uh, but generally speaking, zero rates or negative rates and significant support for long-term securities, in my view, would be characterized as accommodating. Emerging markets also, we have seen many interest rate cuts and, and on the fiscal policy side, we're beginning to see signs of accommodation in emerging markets. You, Japan, US, all I think would be amenable toward fiscal policy next year. We're not quite there yet. In fact, in the case of Japan, we have a consumption tax hike, which would require some calibration on the fiscal side to soften the blow. Uh, there are many issues beyond trade war that we need to keep an eye on. We don't have time to go through these in detail, uh, but we've been writing about these things extensively. Um, a secular soft match, both in global electronic cycle and auto sectors, secular slowdown in domestic demand in China, independent of trade war, the risk of a conflagration.
situation in the Middle East and of course what's happening to Hong Kong and what it means for Hong Kong's currency, property market and so on. We will provide you with links of all these publications that have come out earlier this week and late last week. Uh, we encourage you to read them and uh, come back to us if you have questions. I want to leave this section with one major point, which is uh, illustrated on slide eight, which is that China could be a source of major concern uh, going into the last quarter of this year because Chinese companies have major US dollar uh, refinancing requirement. Uh, and this is a chart is showing that whether you're Chinese banks or outside of this chart, you can see similar numbers for Chinese property companies and others, um, uh, they would need to tap into the both capital markets for equities and bonds. And if dollar liquidity is not ample, if there is considerable geopolitical tension around the world between China and the US and there are other issues, uh, this could be a source of worry. So watch out for this issue. Uh, on the issue of oil and gold, uh, it's also related to everything that I've just talked about so far. Uh, despite all the tension in the Middle East, we have actually seen very little action on oil, uh, which has been basically reflecting weak demand out of China and structurally flat demand in Europe. And therefore, uh, all this geopolitical tension notwithstanding, oil has been uh, basically where it has been for the last couple of years, uh, not changed that much. Um, industrial metals like copper, aluminum, uh, zinc, uh, we see similar things. They are not necessarily reflecting any supply side tightness um, they, or, or pick up in demand. They're all very, very soft. Gold, on the other hand, has been the story of this year, uh, picked up sharply. Uh, but if you look at a five-year chart, it doesn't look that spectacular. We've seen run-ups like this in the past as well, only for it to come down subsequently. But right now, it is the negative yield point to safety which is causing some elevation in gold prices. Again, um, our gold analyst has written a very nice report on this earlier this week. We encourage you to take a look at it. Final point before I hand the presentation to Radhika is the uh, U.S. defunding conditions. This relates to the earlier point. Chinese companies have a large wall of maturity this year. Uh, we have seen some tightness uh, in the liquidity side, especially when you look at the LIBOR OI spread. Uh, we would expect Fed easing to help this going forward. Um, but it's not just a question of what the Fed does, it's also a question of what's happening to the dollar and what's happening to global risk appetite. Uh, so in addition to keeping an eye on Chinese companies coming to the market, we have to look at this issue. Uh, let's move on now. Uh, Radhika will touch on the fiscal and monetary policy uh, nexus. Thanks, Temur. Um, so we've got a very good uh you know, a backdrop on what's been happening globally uh, and particularly in the country. So what I wanted to touch upon is essentially the changing uh, nature. Um, I mean, it, it, this year it seems like monetary policy can fix it all. Uh, and we do see a tendency that uh, beyond countries will start looking beyond monetary policy uh, and into fiscal policy uh, as early as late this year going and going into 2020. Uh, to begin that, we've just taken um, uh, a look at Bloomberg consensus uh, as, a, as an example of how expectations have been moving uh, in this past uh, six, seven months. Uh, and you can see that uh, I've chosen, of course, uh, given the space constraint, I've just chosen about four uh, countries and uh, try to give uh, the lay of the land in terms of how the expectations have been moving. And what we can see, um, interestingly, uh, is that on chart uh, 12, that the U.S. expectations are holding up relatively well. Uh, now for 2019, you can see some amount of correction uh, since the start of the year, uh, but still nothing very big. Uh, so you can see a slight uh, downward revision, um, but overall pretty uh, looking pretty steady still. Uh, in Europe is a contrast in those terms, and you can see that expectations have been consistently adjusted lower. Uh, so not only for 2019, but going into 2020 as well, uh, you know, uh, expectations of uh, slowdown continue to persist. Um, and as we see more quarterly numbers, uh, there is a risk that this could be revised even more uh, lower. Uh, for China, you can see that uh, uh, expectations have kind of bottomed out in the sense that 6% uh, is seen as the floor. Uh, so even official estimates have been that growth would be somewhere in the 6, 6.5% uh, band for this year and next, and the consensus have more or less adjusted around that. Um, and lastly, with India, we can see that, again, there too, expectations have been, so consensus has shifted lower. Uh, and in fact, I'd like to highlight here that this is taken as of uh, July. So the latest numbers that came out 
late last week have uh, not been entered as yet and and uh, i suspect uh, that there's going to be another round of revision when this consensus is, is done again, a consensus study is done again. Uh, our own expectations is that in fiscal 19, or uh, fiscal 20 rather, um, it, it growth will be closer uh, in the low 6% handle, which will be 6.2% uh, before things look slightly better. Uh, the main takeaway from this slide is that yes, consensus expectations uh, are moving down, or the consensus is moving down, but I think it's important to remember that a lot of blame is put on the trade wars uh, feat, you know, that, that that is the one major catalyst uh, that is that has been a drain on growth. Um, our belief is that there are multiple cross currents uh, that is affecting growth across the region as well as the G3 space. Uh, this has a lot to do with how the uh, Brexit uncertainty is playing out, how lo local domestic factors are also playing an important part, particularly CapEx formation in, in some of the countries. You've also seen uh, some displacement in terms of public-private spending, uh, business sentiments not being very strong, uh, exports also being affected by their by uh, segment-specific problems like auto and electronics, like they were uh, alluded to earlier, uh, and also also cyclical so down in some of the other geographies. So uh, yes, trade war is a major catalyst, but I don't think um, everything or slowdown everywhere has to do uh, with with what is happening globally. Uh, I think if you were to look at some of the Asian countries which have a domestic heavy uh, reliance on growth, that that too is getting uh, uh, affected or undergoing a slowdown. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so now that there's a slowdown on hand, what is being done? Uh, certainly all hands are on the deck. Um, monetary policy is being used as the first line of defense. Um, and as a chart on the left shows you, we have tried to capture the real short-term rates, uh, which is essentially the gap between where inflation is and where rates are. And you can see that in the past, uh, say about seven, eight months, there has been you know, a lot of action to mean that the central banks have undertaken cuts. Uh, the central, the RBI, the Indian Central Bank, uh, has been a front runner in this in this uh, respect, and they've already cut rates by 110 basis points. Closely behind are Indonesia, uh, bit Philippines. You've seen some sort of action of Korea um, and other countries as well. So uh, this is certainly being used as the first fix uh, for growth, uh, but we do suspect that that might not be enough. Um, essentially, I think the one good thing that's it's happening, or one favorable thing that, that's uh, happening for the central banks is that inflation uh, has not been a problem for many of the Asian countries as well as G3 space. Uh, if anything, it's been surprising on the downside. So that has allowed many of the global central banks to go ahead and ease. Um, and, and I think uh, having the confidence in hand, we do think by the end of 2019, uh, you would see the uh, the Indian Central Bank cut twice more. We also expect Indonesia BI to do one or two more cuts. Philippines also expected to follow suit, uh, and uh, with uh, Korea as well uh, joining the MU. So uh, we'll have few more central bankers joining, and you would see uh, as rates get cut, the real rate cushion uh, is going to narrow as well. Uh, and if we see that happen concurrently, the trade war escalate. Some of the other factors that we had mentioned beyond the trade war also worsen, um, which essentially hurts growth. I think fiscal policy will be the next step to go. Um, and, and barring few countries, a handful of countries in this region, most countries, they're, they're, you know, most economies, particularly in Asia, have their fiscal books in order. Uh, in fact, uh, Indonesia, for example, uh, undershot its, its uh, budget deficit target last year, uh, which is, you know, uh, target was, was adjusted down subsequently, and hence uh, we saw a lot of fiscal correction. Uh, so there is fiscal room. Government debt levels are not that high. So I think if required, most of the governments uh, will be able to step up uh, fiscal support. Uh, and going into, uh, I, I, you know, instead of uh, speaking just on a macro side, I thought it would we take few cases um, uh, that is already underway in the region. Uh, so of course, starting with G3, you can see that Eurozone growth uh, like we you know, started off talking about, growth has been uh, weak or, or weakening and consensus has been adjusting lower. Uh, so if I were to talk about the heavyweight there, which is Germany, uh, 2Q numbers, you know, second quarter growth was, was a negative. There's a high expectation that third quarter will not look that good as well and there's a risk that, that we would see a technical recession there. Again, trade war is a is a uh, driver, uh, but not 
all of it. So you've seen weakness in capital good orders. You've also seen weakness in auto uh, that is impacting uh, German output. Uh, and you know production as well as manufacturing cycle has been undergoing a slowdown so that is hurting growth um, the european central bank has is leading the dovish pact so there has been a lot of uh, guidance uh, that they're going to do uh, more they meet next week uh, again expectations are high that they're going to uh, cut rates we do expect a cut in the deposit facility rate uh, uh, along with a signal for qe um, the third tranche of the LTRO is also going to be uh, uh, announced. So there's a lot of action um, uh, under, uh, likely at the ECB meeting next week. Um, at the same time, um, uh, Germany is, ex is, is seeing the, the limits that monetary policy can hit, and hence you've seen the government start talking about uh, potential stimulus. Now we need to remember that their fiscal uh, position is quite strong, um, and there's a general aversion uh, to consider a, a loose fiscal policy, but if growth really disappoints, you would see Germany consider uh, uh, you know, a shift towards uh, loose fiscal policy and stimulate the economy in the short term as well as long term. That would probably involve some tax breaks and go into more infrastructure spending um, uh, uh, to, support, uh, to support growth. Uh, going out to India, uh, India, like I mentioned earlier, the central bank growth, uh, you know, which was out last week, uh, disappointed. It was at a six-year low. Um, you also had uh, already the central bank had actually front-loaded uh, policy action, so the rates are down by 110 basis points. Uh, transmission uh, was slow, uh, but has lately caught up. Uh, still, there's a lot more room to go, but there is some positive action there. Uh, but as monetary policy runs its course, you also have the government now stepping in to take some action. Uh, till date, the measures that have been announced don't carry significant fiscal costs, uh, but we do believe that if uh, the anticipated recovery in the second half of the year doesn't play through, uh, that there will be uh, uh, you know, a pressure to build on a broader fiscal stimulus. Uh, so, you know, the, the, I think the speculation will rise that there could be as much as a 30 to 50 basis point increase in the deficit target, uh, partly because of stimulus, partly also because revenues might not uh, turn out to be strong because growth has been weak. Uh, and lastly, with Thailand, uh, you know, growth here has also been weak. The central bank cut rates in August. Uh, they are only about 25 basis point away from the uh, global financial crisis low, uh, which was at about 1.25%. Uh, the, the Thailand also has another issue on hand because the Thai baht is the regional outperformer. Uh, it's about 6% up on the year. And uh, so because of that, uh, the BOT is has, has, uh, uh, looking at, you know, a currency being in, in um, uh, running, uh, uh, you know, not really in line with the fundamentals and hence uh, looking at policy as well as non-policy measures to arrest uh, baht's over outperformance. Uh, fiscal stimulus has already been announced, uh, and I think it's going to be, to begin with, it will be more to do with supporting incomes um, and holding up demand at a time when external challenges are rising, and you also have a government spending that is being delayed. Uh, so uh, the the and I think the underlying message being from the region as well as uh, some of the G3 space is that uh, growth slowdown is happening, not purely because everything is not about the trade war. Uh, monetary policy action has been put in. But we suspect that, medic that medicine will not be enough and that 2020 uh, would be uh, uh, more to do with the fiscal policy support. Uh, thank you very much. And I think with this, I'll pass the waiting on to uh, Philip, who will give you an overview on various currency pairs. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Radhika. Okay, uh, very quickly, I'm just going to uh, run through our dollar view. Okay. Uh, the underlying uh, view is still unchanged. Uh, dollar is still holding up pretty well, uh, moving, you know, grinding up higher. Uh, what we have done today is to show you that uh, focus is turning to next year's outlook. And uh, you can see from the growth forecast that we have for 2020, uh, US is still holding up pretty well. Eurozone is still pretty weak. And Japan, after a blip up, you know, recent blip up for 2019, uh, probably after the GST is going to come back off again. So, uh, but that said, uh, the dollar is at the, I think, top end of its channel. So I do believe there's some short-term uh, reprieve. Uh, we have seen an easing of geopolitical risk, you know, from Hong Kong 
and now uh, Brexit is sort of in a limbo, but uh, risk is still there. And of course, most importantly, the uh, China and US have agreed to resume trade talks in October. So let's see uh, how that goes on. Uh, moving on, uh, for uh, the Roaming P, um, we have uh, highlighted two charts, uh, two charts here. Uh, one is to uh, demonstrate um, the similarities of this trade war, uh, how the Roaming P has behaved uh, as to the period when it was uh, named a manipulator from 92 to 94. So uh, circumstances are pretty different. I think uh, this time around we have to pay more attention to tariff and on the right hand side uh, what we have presented is a hypothetical adjustment uh, calculation of where we think the roaming peak uh, should be you know for the tariffs that come in and the tariffs that are coming in so uh, currently uh, with the 10 percent on 300 billion it should be around 740 but because of the trade talks you know so uh, that we were expecting, uh, we have put the forecast uh, uh, still around 720 in the event of uh, any positive outcome. But nonetheless, uh, I think uh, what is important to me at this juncture is that the tariff that is coming in October, um, uh, the 5% increase, especially for the 250 billion, uh, the tariff rate will go up to 30%. So if this continues and trade talks break down, then for sure, I think we are going to go. I think this will affirm the market's fear of a very prolonged uh, trade war, and that you know tariff rate could go up. Please remember that uh, during Trump's, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, last campaign uh, in 2016, uh, he did talk about bringing uh, China's tariffs up to as high as 45 percent. Okay, so but <clears throat> for now, um, let's hope for a positive outcome. Okay, coming to Brexit. Uh, for the sterling pound, this is more challenging. Uh, we have seen MPs returning to Parliament from the recess. They have voted uh, to take control, to block uh, the no deal uh, from Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So, um, in outrage you know, for proroguing uh, Parliament uh, by appointing the Queen's speech on October 14. But uh, the risk of a no deal Brexit is still around as long as uh, Prime Minister Johnson doesn't resign or as long as he doesn't agree to delay, uh, to postpone uh, the Brexit day. You know, so uh, I think the one key risk that uh, I'm paying attention to uh, is, you know, the whether there'll be a no vote confidence because technically uh, if the no vote confidence passes and, he, and uh, the opponents fail to uh, come up with an alternative government after the 14-day cooling, he could automatically, uh, he's required to uh, appoint an uh, election date, you know, and then uh, and dissolve parliament uh, five days, uh, five weeks earlier. So he has threatened uh, to appoint uh, uh, such an election date after Brexit day. So, so again, uh, highlight that as long as uh, there's no resignation as long as he doesn't delay uh, Brexit day. Uh, the risk of a default no deal Brexit remains. But that's it. I think for Sterling, our view right now is that uh, you have to compare uh, the environment today and that after the referendum in 2016. Today, the economy is not looking good, even with a deal. Uh, the BUE reckoned there's a one in three chance of a recession. And I think the guild market is. Uh, believe that uh, BOE needs to cut rates. Uh, rating agencies with recession risk you know, are also uh, on watch. They have uh, downgraded UK uh, in 2013 uh, when the GDP uh, turned negative quarter and quarter for a second time. So, uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, fiscal stimulus uh, under uh, Prime Minister Johnson is expected to be much stronger, especially in the no deal Brexit. Um, as for the euro, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Eurozone is weak. Um, all ex, you know, so it's returned to its uh, post QE range that we've seen uh, after uh, ECB started QE in March 2015. So I think um, the charts are self-explanatory 
that the you know uh, eurozone economy is much weaker than where it was in 2016, just before you know uh, it took off um, very strongly, um, you know, uh, leading uh, euro to break out from 115 to 125, and today we are back, you know, um, and testing the uh, 110 level. So, uh, as Radhika has mentioned, um, ECB is moving to rate cuts. And of course, we are you know, looking to see uh, what they intend to do on the stimulus front as well as uh, for Germany. Okay, last but not least, uh, coming to uh, the Sing dollar, uh, we are not calling for a recession, but nonetheless, I think it's uh, important uh, to sort of um, have an idea of uh, what to do in the event that you know, uh, Fed, you know, there is one, and you know, uh, we have a what I call Fed needs to do a recession rate cut cycle. Okay, so um, today's uh, where we are today, where the ten year bond yield is deeply below the Fed funds rate, uh, is similar to what we experienced just before the dot com crisis. So we went through, I uh, think, a, a, a sequence of events from currency war to a recovery into the Fed hike cycle, and now we're experiencing a trade recession. And um, so, to cut a long story short, uh, for the dollar thing, um, whenever we have a US led global recession, um, when Fed cuts aggressively, you know, the tendency uh, for this very export dependent currency is to depreciate first. So, dollar thing will normally spike first before it stabilizes when uh, Fed cuts are deep enough, you know, to sort of stabilize uh, markets. So, that's just food for thought. Uh, it's not a forecast that we're looking for. Uh, we still think uh, our forecasts are still looking for dollar sing to continue uh, grinding up, you know, as highlighted in the shaded areas. So uh, that's all for me. I'll pass uh, the floor to Duncan. Okay, thanks, Philip. Um, so on interest rates, um, I thought it'd be interesting to first look at negative yields. Uh, we know that recently there has been a lot of interest in tracking the amount of negative yielding debt in the Bloomberg Barclays Global Ag Aggregate Index Universe. And this year we have seen that as global bond yields have kept falling, this measure has kept climbing. And I believe at present, the measure is currently around $17 trillion, or about 30% of the index universe. So instead of you know, focusing on the negative yields, we thought it'd be interesting to ask the question, you know, if, that if there's so much negative yields out there, where are the positive yields? And we put down the index universe and we find that 55% of the positive yields are actually in the US, of which around 40% of that 55% are actually in US treasuries. So, and, and if you look at the table below, in the, at the bottom of the slide, we decided to take things one step further. We did a simple sensitivity analysis where we bumped lower all the bond yields by 50 and 100 bips to see how the numbers would change. So as you can see, for a 50 bips bump, the value of positive yielding bonds would fall by about $5 trillion from $39.7 to $34.3 trillion. Sorry. So the interesting thing to note in this table is that as global bond yields continue to fall, the US share of positive yielding bonds is expected to keep increasing from 55% today to possibly 63% and 69% if we assume a 50 bips and a 100 bips uh, bump in yields lower. And we think that this has massive implications for investors. For investors that need positive yields, they would find that they have to buy increasingly more US fixed income. And if you consider that at present, US hedging costs are actually quite high, they would have to buy more fixed income and unhedge for FX. So we think this is something interested to interesting trend to keep note of. And relating to the negative yields, um, this year has seen a clear flight to safety of sovereign bonds. Uh, at present, we think that globally sovereign bonds are pricing in a rather downbeat economic outlook and quite a bit of monetary easing ahead. Um, so what I have on the two charts below are uh, the market pricing for the US Fed and the ECB. Uh, currently, markets are pricing for the Fed to cut Fed funds rate to about 1% over 
over the next 18 to 20 months and then they are expected to stay on pause for the next couple of years. Uh, on a similar time frame, the ECB is expected to cut the deposit rate to about negative 80 bips. So from our perspective, we think that you know, bonds are likely to be quite rich you know, unless, unless you assume that the global slowdown that we are currently witnessing is going to worsen quite a bit from here, in, in which case that would warrant uh, global central banks will ease much more aggressively. We could be talking about you know, the Fed cutting to zero or central banks like the RBA joining the QE game. But at the same time, we recognize that you know, despite all these rich valuations, the backdrop, you know, whether it's slowing growth, whether it's uh, low inflation, trade wars, it is all very bond positive, very bond friendly. So I'm afraid that the risk is asymmetric in the sense that if, say, we see a small rebound in yields, that could very likely be seen as an opportunity for investors to actually buy into any dips in bond prices. Um, and of late, we, we find that Japanese government bonds are very interesting, and they deserve special uh, mention over here. Um, we think it's one of those bonds that is not cheap, but it's quite a bit cheaper. So um, this year, because of the restraint that was posed by the BOJ's yield curve control policy, uh, we realized that JGB bond yields have fallen much less and the slopes have flattened much less compared to global peers. So to, to give you a sense of some of the numbers, year to date within G10, 10-year JGB yields have fallen 27 bips. But the G10 peer average, the G10 peer group has fallen an average of 97 bips. So we're talking about 27 versus 97. That's a big difference. So we, we think that within its, the GTM peer, peer group, JGBs are quite attractive. Their yields are relatively high. Uh, but we just want to point out that the window of opportunity to lock in on this relatively high yields on JGBs could be closing because um, the 10-year JGB yields have recently broke past and have been trading below the negative 20 bits lower bound of the target range since August 9. Um, due, largely due to the downward pull by global yields. So at this upcoming policy meeting on September 19th, we think that the BOJ could very likely widen or lower the 10-year JGB target range, which um, we, we expect to see 10-year bond yields actually get lower. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have for interest rates. Thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Uh, we will now move on to the question and answer session, but I just want to add one point, which is uh, related to the point that Duncan was making, that central banks uh, may be reaching the point where there would be additional questions about whether they need to expand their toolboxes. Uh, can there be more innovative ways of uh, easing uh, cost of funding? pushing liquidity into the economy, getting cash on the hands of households, uh, as opposed to just pushing on a string and trying to have more and more negative um, lending rates, uh, which uh, the transmission of which seems to be uh, highly questioned uh, by the markets these days. Um, and uh, we probably will see something coming out of the ETB on this issue. Who knows, maybe the BOJ will also have to get uh, creative, especially if they go ahead with the consumption tax hike and at some point early next year we see the Japanese economy uh, weakening and the demand for something coming from the monetary side rises again. Uh, looking at the wide range of questions that we have, and in the remaining time it is impossible to go over all of them, but I will sort of begin to collect my thoughts, go through them, but before I do that, I want to take one of the questions right in the middle and pass it to Radhika. Radhika, as you can see, it's the question on the Indian market about the lower growth and overall outlook, so maybe a couple of minutes for you um, on top of what you have talked about India so far. Sure, thanks, uh, uh, So the question is, uh, what are your views on the Indian markets, especially as uh, growth, uh, you know, ha has been weak and uh, various initiatives have been taken by the Indian government? Um, our take is uh, certainly growth disappointed. Uh, I think uh, we uh, had a subconsensus estimate; uh, it was weak. It came in weaker than that. Um, much of the disappointment was on the consumption front, uh, and and you know, investment growth was also quite tepid. 
Um, we do the reaction. I think will will not be similar across the asset market. So much of the weakness we do expect. Uh, 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 we are afraid that it would be uh, in the equity markets essentially because um, because of disappointing growth, uh, nominal GDP particularly being quite weak. Uh, you have seen investors now. You know initially they were enthused by the fact that the FPI surcharge was removed by the government. But what has happened since that there's generally a worry about growth and generally worry about corporate earnings and hence uh, equity equities have generally uh, uh, underperformed. Uh, on the bond end, we do see risks of yield steepening, uh, essentially because low short end of the curve is uh, now repricing further rate cuts. Uh, hence, we see for the downside for the short end of the yield curve, where on the longer end, worries about fiscal support um, uh, and, and further fiscal stimulus will keep the 10-year, for instance, uh, uh, steady or you know, edging higher um, over the coming months. Uh, on the rupee, particularly, um, uh, we do think that, you know, like Philip mentioned, we are of the camp who expect dollar strength to remain. Uh, that coupled with um, uh, the yuan, which is increasingly becoming a factor to, uh, to you know, or an influence for the rupee, um, will also be something that we would be looking very closely at. So tying in a firmer dollar and the likelihood of further yuan weakness, uh, we do expect the dollar rupee uh, to edge back towards 72 and beyond. So uh, this is largely the reaction that we expect. It's not going to be similar across the board, um, uh, with, with especially the FX focused more on the global catalyst. Thanks, Radhika. And related to that, uh, there is a very interesting piece of research Radhika wrote last week on the overall India outlook. And one thing that was pointed out was some of the analysis that we have done about how the weight of the RMB over time has increased and the weight of dollar has decreased vis-a-vis -vis, uh, INR, uh, which would be surprising to most observers given that India doesn't seem to be part of the regional supply chain or the impact on trade war, but India does so. Of course, the rest of Asia, the weight to RMB is even higher. Uh, okay. We're back to the questions from uh, the what that we've received so far. Uh, firstly, other than Vietnam, which economies are benefiting from the ongoing trade war? Nobody really is benefiting. I wouldn't say even Vietnam is benefiting. Uh, Vietnam has been on the receiving end of offshoring from China for much longer than uh, the, the duration of the trade war and will remain so even if trade wars were to get resolved tomorrow. Uh, it is attractive because of its uh, human capital, because of type of uh, uh, logistics it offers to global investors and surely the trade war narrative uh, increases incentive but I've seen articles in recent weeks which also show that in terms of economies of scale it is very hard for Vietnam or for that matter any other economy in the world to match what China offers if we are going to take the logical extension of trade wars uh, let's be clear there will be offshoring out of China things will move out companies around the world will make things outside of China to supply, particularly to the United States, but that would make the supply chain more brittle. The economies of scale that the world has enjoyed because of China being a factory will erode. That would create a world that is less efficient, uh, perhaps more prone to supply side shocks, and perhaps more inflationary. Uh, these are the long-term implication of uh, manufacturing moving out of China, in my view. There are a bunch of questions on the inversion of yield curve and uh, European investors issuers coming to the market. Uh, we think that you know negative yields are here to stay for the time being, particularly out of Europe. Uh, if anything, under Christian Lagarde, uh, ECB might even you know, double up on income monetary accommodation, regardless of some complaints we are having hearing from European banks. Um, and once you get into this world, it is very hard to get out. Short of a major uh, pull from the U.S. or China in the coming years, uh, it is very difficult to come up with a scenario where Europe, which is so dependent on manufacturing and exports, can uh, you know see significantly higher growth rate, which then allows them to move up to substantially positive nominal rates. So we are in this world where increasingly Japan-type tendencies are becoming rife. Uh, there were questions on our view on the Fed rates. Uh, there, you know, we on the long end of the curve, we have been bullish and we have seen curves flatten and then invert. But the short end of the curve, and I take personal liability for that, is that we haven't been joining the markets and calling for many uh, rate cuts in the coming months and quarters. Uh, we only have one rate cut built in for the rest of the year. And so far for 2020, despite the fact that we're forecasting 1.5% growth, uh, we are not calling for many rate cuts. We may well succumb to the market's uh, pricing and, and call for more rate cuts uh, in, in the coming days. But for the time being, our view remains 
while growth slowdown is likely, it can very easily be ameliorated through some sort of a trade deal. And given that 2020 is an election year, there will be significant incentive on the part of the Trump administration to work out a trade deal, which will then improve investment sentiment, which by then, uh, by that extension, would remove significant amount of doom and gloom that is persisting in the world, which is uh, necessitating a uh, dovish uh, move by the Fed. So it's a bit of a circular logic here. We don't think um, uh, the U.S. economy is about to fall off a cliff. We also think that there will be some sort of a uh, communication, positive communication from the U.S. government with respect to the trade war through the course of 2020. And together, they may uh, reduce the need for uh, further accommodation. But at the same time, uh, President Trump has been very aggressively demanding the Fed to cut. And we have seen former New York Fed President uh, Bill Dudley getting involved in this uh, discussion with a rather provocative article where he said the Fed should be proactively uh, signaling to the markets that it is not going to offset trade war risks by cutting rates. It would follow data and only then act. it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, in the September policy meeting, if uh, the Fed communication has any major extension beyond what they said in the last one, which is that they, they're going through a mid-cycle correction. Um, we have already heard from a number of regional Fed governors who are against further rate cuts. Uh, the market has completely ignored those talk from regional Fed governors because the market is convinced that Jay Powell is looking at the global uh, demand weakening dynamic far more than any positive data that's coming out of the U.S., and therefore he will cut again in September and perhaps even more in later in the fourth quarter. Uh, we are still on the fence, uh, but then again, market pricing is completely against the point that we made, and also as far as the shape of the curve, as far as the likely rally in the long end is concerned there, we are very much in line with the consensus for the markets. Our difference is basically on the very short end. Um, is there going to be a financial crisis in 2020? Will there be, a, uh, or how will the trade war scenario pan out in 2020? I think the answer to both question, in our view, is a lot of this stuff will depend upon China, not the U.S. Uh, and the reason for that is the drag that can come from a China slowdown, the drag that can come to the global financial markets from Chinese companies having problem raising debt, is far greater than anything else we see in the horizon. So. The global outlook, in our view, rests firmly on the outlook of China, both economy and the financial sector. So far, I have to give close to an A to the Chinese authorities in terms of the fiscal and monetary policy impulse they have sent out both in 2018 and 2019. Uh, They have been dovish when the world was hawkish, and they have been neutral when the world has turned dovish. Uh, They are, in my view, uh, doing a very good job of being forward-looking than most of the central banks, uh, and uh, the uh, lack of interest in creating one more credit bubble, the sustained interest in continuing some degree of deleveraging in my view will hold China in good stead for the medium term. And even if it continues to slow as long as it is orderly, I think that would help out. The issue really is the dollar weakness, supply of dollar, and the huge amount of reliance that Chinese companies have on dollar funding, and whether there's going to be some uh, politics uh, uh, involved in that uh, as, as China-U.S. tensions. Um, uh, continue to bubble. Finally, on Brexit, uh, Philip has already touched on this issue, uh, but in terms of the Brexit chaos and it's affecting the city of London, the the outlook for the FTSE and so on, our general view is it's very hard to come up with a rosy scenario for the UK anytime soon, uh, whether there's an election, not an election, whether uh, Labour uh, takes over the government or Mr. Johnson uh, manages to get a proper uh, prime ministerial run. Uh, none of those scenarios would be impressive for the markets. And more importantly, regardless of what happens with respect to Brexit, I think City of London is going to struggle with clearing trades that are for European investors, trading and managing money from European investors and so on. So that decoupling, in my view, is inevitable, and that certainly will hurt uh, London stock markets and the financial sector. Uh, may not be substantial. Maybe UK's appeal, maybe London's appeal will persist uh, independent of the Brexit trajectory but it is hard to think it would create major upside anytime soon. Um, That would be it. Uh, There are a few other questions here and there. Um, You can read our weekly that is coming out tomorrow morning to see us address some of those questions. Uh, We appreciate uh, uh, everyone who is dialed in from all over the world for this call. Uh, We appreciate your questions. Uh, We will come back to you again next month. Until then, we'll close the live stream. Thank you very much. Have a great day.